Hey everybody, good afternoon, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, brothers, sisters, friends, enemies, and frenemies. It's Brother Rob Wilson here today. Uh, recently I gave you a, a intro to this video we're doing tonight with a transitioning demon slayer, and he wanted to share his experience with deliverance and the growth he has experienced as he has a more biblical view of deliverance. So please welcome to the show tonight, uh, Daniel, I'm just going to put it, Daniel H. is in the house. Well, let me give him a round of applause. Uh, this brother reached out to me. He has extensive experience in the deliverance ministry, and I thought it would be informative for him to share, and he wants to share with us his experiences with uh, deliverance. So welcome, Daniel. I appreciate you coming on tonight. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Because uh, this is what we need. We need real testimonies of people's experiences in real time. So you want to tell us about um, how you got involved with the deliverance ministry, who you got involved with first. And like you, like you told me, you have extensive experience across different deliverance ministries. So go ahead whenever you're ready. Of course. Um, well, my name is Daniel H. I'm 37 years old. I live in the Midwest. And um, I'm a born again believer, uh, baptized. Um, I believe in the Trinity. You know, I would consider myself a Christian. And um, I've done various things from uh, going to different places to help build churches, such as uh, in Juarez, Mexico. Um, I was down there helping build a church um, in my younger years. I went to Lame Deer, Montana, which is a um, Indian reservation and helped out there for a couple weeks. And I've also been to Marble, Arkansas, doing ministry there, um, helping paint houses and, and things of the sort. So, um, I was that's awesome. brought, oh, thank you very much. Yeah, that's um, awesome. I was you, got brought a heart up, for, you got a heart for reaching out and doing, doing work that, uh, does real things in people's real lives. So, yeah, so you're, you're evan ev evangelical and you're, servant minded. So when did you get in? I think you were getting ready to segue into it. And hey, look, y'all, uh, let me tell you something, Daniel, when this video airs, they're going to call us brothers from another mother because of your hair. I love the hairstyle, brother. Thank you. Us, us bald brothers got it really going on. <laughs> it wasn't by choice, but I've owned it. And, um, you know, it is what it is. I, I just try to be the best version of myself I can be. And you've accomplished that. You've accomplished that. Let me tell you the truth about being bald before we get into this Demon Slayer business. I started shaving my head at 37. I wasn't bald. I had hair and I had been using clippers down to the number one clipper. So it was like real short hair. So then I just said, let it all go. And I've been free ever since. I've been shaving my head for 20 years. So back, lest I digress, lest we digress, back to the Demon Slayers. How, what brought you, how did you get involved with that, brother? Well, I was um, raised in a Christian household, uh, actually adopted by my parents. So um, I feel like I have a need in my heart to help others the way, um, you know, my family helped me. And first and foremost, uh, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, comes first, um, and my family comes second. And um, so I was looking for a route to sort of branch out in ministry um, and try to, I, I wasn't sure that I wanted to go all the way in and be like a pastor, uh, but I wanted to serve in a capacity where I could help others. And around 2019, 2020, um, Isaiah Saldivar became very popular on YouTube. Oh. And, um, I confess that I, at that time, didn't really have a church home that I was going to, like, a ground base where I was going. Um, although I am a part of a Presbyterian church in Wisconsin uh, called Crossroads Presbyterian, um, I haven't been a faithful um, person in going to the service every Sunday. So I was looking for a way to still exercise my faith. Um, and I found the online ministries to be, you know, exactly what I was looking for at the time, because um, although churches were still meeting at that time, we all remember what happened with the pandemic. 
Mm -hmm. And that's just basically all I even want to say about it. But um, I was at home looking for a, a place to belong and, you know, still feel like I was doing something in ministry. And um, Isaiah's ministry kind of evolved from his online perspective and teachings to um, having this deliverance map. And that's something that I got very excited about, the idea of being someone in Christ, being able to serve and having, you know, the title of um, being on his map, that excited me. It, it gave me um, a feeling of like validation that, wow, I'm actually, even though everybody's sitting at home right now, I'm, you know, a deliverance person or minister who can, you know, go help people. And, and um, it felt good. Although I never received any formal training other than the videos I was watching from Isaiah online. So um, do you want to explain to anybody who's listening right now who doesn't know what the deliverance map is? You want to go into where that's at and a little bit more about what it is? Uh, the way I came about it was um, by sort of promotion from Isaiah on his um, channel. Mm -hmm. And I was watching hours worth of his content. Just I may have watched every video that was out there at the time and I've obviously fallen off since but there was a time where I had felt like I was treating his um, deliverance uh, ministry like almost like a college course okay so, well the map is on a web a, a separate website from his YouTube uh, uh, so I'll explain that a little bit more sorry um basically what I did was I went to his website his personal website and basically applied to be um, you know, deliverance minister or helper on his deliverance map. And that's a place where you can go. It's kind of like a map that shows little pins on the, on the location. So you could zoom into your location and then um, click on a pin and it would display a name, a phone number, and a little bit of you know, basic information about the person you were gonna potentially meet with. And so, um, I have to say it took a while for them to get back to me. I kind of thought that they would probably reach out to me and want to speak to me a little bit more about, you know, my background, but it was literally um, just one day I was getting phone calls from people who were looking. I didn't even realize I was, I had gone, you know, active. So there was oh. nobody really reaching out to me saying that, okay, you're a, you're a person now. I knew I was on the map because phone, phone calls started coming in. Wow. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it wasn't like a formal or professional, you know, at that time. And I'm, I'm not even sure if it still is. I've since, um, since removed myself from the deliverance map. And um, again, the process took a long time for them to acknowledge it. So um, even while I kind of felt like I was done with it, I was still getting calls from the deliverance uh, map. And I was ha having to tell people, um, I'm not the right person to do this anymore. I'm not, you know, flowing in this ministry anymore. So I kind of had to, I said, the best thing I can offer you is some prayer and encouragement, but I'm not doing the casting out anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one thing I looked at when I, when I even heard about it online was that, for example, people going on the deliverance map are the deliverance ministers who are available in certain areas. And, you know, they state they state right there on the deliverance map that they take no responsibility mm -hmm. for for anything related to the map. No, they um, don't take responsibility. It says like almost as a little dis disclaimer, it seems. And um, say you're out in the field with a very difficult um, situation where, you know, you've been del doing deliverance for four hours and the best the person can say is that. They feel a little bit better, but nothing is fully left. Not everything is left. Um, you might want to call somebody and and say like, "Where do I go from here?" They don't really at um, you know have any support um, mm -hmm. that you could call other than maybe watching a video related to the topic that you're dealing with. But somebody could be on that deliverance map with any type of criminal background, and they haven't been vetted necessarily. 
Uh, that's correct. As you know, as far as I was concerned, um, there was times where at first I was nervous about having people like to my home. So I was doing the deliverance in the park across the street. And um, there was a gentleman that showed up and within, you know, 10 minutes of the deliverance starting where I was praying for him in the gazebo and um, there was police all around and he made a run for it to somebody's car, hopped in and took off. Wow. And I was, I was very devastated. So it, it could be, I was looking at it more or less like the deliverance minister himself could be a risky customer, but also the person who's calling for deliverance, they could have, they could have, a, there could be a lot of risks about meeting them. They could be, they could be criminals. They could be planning to rob the person when they show up. They could, you know, anything could happen. There's a lot of risk involved in that. It's, it, in my opinion, um, from my experience, it's, it's no safer than Craigslist. No, oh, yeah, that's not safe either. People have lost their lives over Craigslist. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Probably less safe, but wow. So, okay, so you're on the deliverance list and you had some questionable experiences with delivering people. What type of people were you finding you were most meeting who were calling you? I was finding that um, there was people who had been severely damaged, whether it be through physical abuse, traumatic abuse, or addiction, um, that even with all the knowledge I believed I had with the videos I had watched, I wasn't prepared to handle some of the things that were, um, you know, thrown my way because by no means was I an expert. Um, and that sort of adds into the idea of like um, pride that I felt about being excited that I was somebody who could, you know, offer deliverance um, and I was part of Isaiah's ministry, um, it kind of pumped me up to the point where I questioned and had to come to terms with, am I doing this for, you know, um, worldly renown or am I doing this for Jesus Christ? I get it. And from what I found, and and, and it's, it's hard to admit and it's embarrassing to admit that I may have been deceived, but at the same time, I found that it was um, more of a competition for who was the coolest or who was the highest up on Isaiah's ladder, you know, um, rather than who was actually glorifying Christ. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's if you really think about it, it appeals the idea of me being some type of personal power ranger who can go out and you know perform this exorcism, um, it's appealing. It's appealing to people who want to serve and they, they want to help people. And, you know, it, it boosts your ego. You're in a special, from, from what I've watched, it, it you know, it, it makes it seem like you're in a special elite force of Christianity, you know? Um, so I can see. It makes you feel like you're a soldier. You're, mm -hmm. you're, a, you're a, you know, soldier for Christ, a soldier for God. And, and I believe that, um, that's a, a true thing. That's a real thing. But, um, as far as like the, the, um, pride I felt it was on, it was not a biblical thing. I felt like I was going to be the man. And, and if something didn't work out, you know, it was all about me. And, and it was hard for me to take on the idea that like, um, I could just let Christ lead. Mm -hmm. You know, and then that weighed heavily on me even more. And yeah. so the fruit that I found wasn't calming or happy. It, it made my life worse. And I took on more of a burden, almost um, being demonized when trying to deliver demons, if that even makes sense. Like, oh, yeah, I was going out to the, the act of doing the deliverance brought the demonization onto me. And it was a self um, thing that I had to overcome through the help of Jesus Christ in prayer. Amen. I can and see I'm still it, working through it as well. There's, <clears throat> we have to get over the fact, and, and this, you know, this, that get over the fact that uh, our desire to help others can, will never be trumped by the will of God. Some some pastors, you know, who have s s succumbed to self deletion. It wasn't that they were uncaring. 
It wasn't that they were unsaved even. It was that they overly carried a burden for the people and to, to see lives changed that, that no man is capable of bearing. We're not meant to carry the burdens of others. You know, that, that goes from the, from the least of us to the greatest. My role, even if I were discipling you and helping you, is not to take your burdens upon myself. It's to help you learn to allow Christ to be your, you know, your savior, your your deliverer, your your all in all. I'm not, and see that's a, that's a mistake in ministry. People want to become somebody else's all in all. You, you follow me? I do, and um, the way I've come to terms with it is that um, you know there was times where. Um, I would go out and do these deliverances and um, nothing would really happen, even though I felt prayed up, sanctified, I'd been fasting. And um, so I would look internally and say, oh, I must not be repentant enough. I must not be, you know, I, I must be the problem. So then I'm turning around saying, um, okay, I need deliverance now. Right. And so, um, I was going and and that's kind of how I got involved with the uh, supernatural life is um as opposed to Isaiah which is kind of more um you know anything is happening there's lots of different people on the pins um on the map um the supernatural life offered more of like a hub system where I could join like a group of people and um, they even offered a little bit more structure where there was like a leader of each hub who would, you know, um, take you through the coursework and decide if you be a certified forerunner, um, which at that point you had to know a lot of their, um, you know, what their doctrine basically and almost recite it word for word. Um, otherwise you weren't ready for you know, to be certified. And then um, they wanted it to be kind of exclusive. So say you knew the doctrine really well, but, um, you know, they weren't ready to let you in or whatever. The reason could be that you needed deliverance then. So I went through two or three um, deliverances uh, on, on the supernatural life through a hub leader. And so that at that point, I was wondering, like, okay, am I ready to be certified now? Um, and, you know, at that point, Daniel Adams had had some information come out or something come out about the idea that he was paying actors to, to do the deliverances. And I had questions about that. So I brought it to the um, hub leader's attention and um, it went from being like this all-inclusive group to how dare you question our leader? You know, we're the leaders. You need to submit to us. You need to respect your leader and all these things. And um, I was just, I just dared to ask the question, you know, is this real? Like, is he really um, paying mm -hmm. people? And um, I even have the um, pictures from the chat room of people using curse words at me, you know, went from this, you know, biblical Bible study to, um, finger pointing and then when I um, turned around and, and, and finger pointing and swearing and then when I turned around and had prayer time about it I realized like that wasn't fruitful at all and I was hurt by it and um, you know that's kind of the story of what happened with the supernatural life ministry um, kind of in congruence with what I, what I was doing with um, the deliverance map but now back to the deliverance map situation, I had, you know, at that point done, I don't know, maybe 10, 15, 20 deliverances in person. Um, people were calling me and um, I was either going to their house or they, having them come to the park. And um, all of a sudden Isaiah started the Discord server. And that got me really excited too because I thought that might give me a uh, opportunity to do the deliverance on on the computer um, through like the Skype style Discord server. They offer you a, the opportunity to do like a live call. So um, I basically messaged Isaiah directly through the Discord, 
and offered my name, a picture of myself and his merchandise. Um, and I had met with him once before at a conference he held. So we had a little picture together, just like a five minute, hey, how you doing? Can I get a picture with you? Sure. And um, he was kind enough to oblige that. So I sent that picture as well of us together. And right away he acknowledged it and said, okay, you can be a Discord um, moderator. So um, I was really excited about that. I felt like almost like this feeling internally, like, well, I've made it. And I was really happy to be a part of that. And um, that was a really bad decision on my part because part of the moderator's responsibility was, and it's not something I was getting paid for. Um, it was just to help decide um, who belonged in the chat or didn't belong in the chat when you know bad things would happen like people would come in and try to like raid the chat room and so it was our responsibility to kick these people out and ban them or warn them or decide how severe their you know whatever they had done had been and then um you know at first it was like wild wild west free for all like anybody could decide to just ban someone if they had the authority and then we kind of okay maybe we should come together and have you know like decisions you know between a group of people whether or not they're um whatever they had done was serious enough to ban so here i am in this little click and i've been given this little sense of authority and um instead of glorifying christ it was all about whether or not people should be banned in the chat room and so, so you I turned was, into the discord gestapo <laughs> exactly exactly right. and, and i and i wanted to be a part of what was going on i wanted to have a say and um i was very guilty for feeling an ego boost at that time and and i don't believe i was the only one i i believe some of the other uh discord members weren't putting jesus first or discord members and moderators mm -hmm. and um kind of basically after praying about that i realized just in the name itself, there was no fruit being, you know, bore. The the name the Discord, Discord was Discord. <laughs> yeah. And and that was like um almost like looking down at your Apple phone and seeing the um Apple with a bite taken out of it mm -hmm. and really realizing, wow, this is the forbidden fruit. Like mm -hmm. I had I had violated exactly what I was trying to avoid. Mm -hmm. I had yeah. I and and so as screwed up as it could all get, or, or, or it may have seemed, this was a internal mental issue that I should have been seeking Jesus for. But instead, I was so caught up in trying to build my way up in the ministry and um, get recognized by Isaiah, that um, I totally lost focus of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have a small, I have a small discord, I'm sure. He had thousands of people in there, but um, really that's to set up, <clears throat> to set up the parameters for how the discords are going to run, like who's allowed and who's not allowed and what conduct is allowed in the discord that that's somebody taking leadership. And if it's Isaiah's discord, he should have taken leadership to set some parameters up for you guys and some standards rather than just throwing a bunch of people out there with a wrench and saying, you know, have at it. So in my discord, uh, the agreement is no discord in the discord. Um, and, and somebody has to take the leadership and say that, you know, it's just a leadership. Yeah. So. Um, and throughout the time that I was involved in it, which wasn't truly a very long time, it was maybe two months, three months. Um, there was so much going on every day that it felt like a longer period of time because I would be at my job, at my job having to address situations within the discord whether or not people deserve to be banned and um so that was like distracting as well and um yeah it got to the point where um you know i was still trying to attempt to do deliverance in the discord server and um i was basically attacked and shamed for doing deliverance on another female um person in the discord server and my honest were intentions were just trying to help but um, you know, after a period of time where the, the doctrine was out, it kind of changed where 
Um, the doctrine became, you should never be doing deliverance one-on-one -on -one with a member of the opposite sex or even really with the opposite sex at all. So then I was, but they you know, didn't tell you that at first. They at didn't first. tell me that at first. Okay. The, the, um, doctrine kind of changed once there was things happening where, you know, sexual things were happening or men were choking women or punching women. And that just totally got out of control in the discord. And, um, no, in not the in the discord, just oh. in, um, just in deliverance in general. You know, the, the doctrine seemed to evolve when, um, I mean, at one point there was a video, I believe, out there of Isaiah choking a woman. Oh, he said he said he choked a woman when he first got saved, right? Mm -hmm. okay. That's what I'm referring to. So, yeah. so um, you know, even Isaiah, you know, not that I know him personally, we've met twice and spoken maybe two or three times. You know, even he has been in violation of some of his own um, things that you're not supposed to do. And that has kind of changed along the way. And I can see why it's changed. Um, but my honest intention was to only, you know, try to help free this person based on, at the time, the doctrine I had been given, which was videos oh, to, well, to no, watch. Nobody can abide by a rule they haven't been told till after they've done something. That's kind of like a... That's kind of like a trick question, you know. Hey, you violated our rule. I know I didn't tell you about it, but now we're going to punish you for it. So what actually came from that? What did well, I was I was basically brought into like a server room with all the other Discord moderators. And um, they basically handed down my judgment saying that like I no longer belonged on the um, server uh, moderator team because... I had violated this this thing and it was so severe and it crushed me. And when I tried to, um, you know, speak my piece, I was put on silence. So I couldn't even say anything. I was basically just talking to nobody. And then I left the Discord server, shut it down, deleted my account. And I was just like, I, I had spoken to um, my father, who's very active in the church. And he said, Look at the way you treated, you were treated. Does that feel like something a Christian would do? And it was immediately apparent and glaring that I had wasted a lot of time, made a huge mistake being involved, didn't glorify Jesus at all, and that I needed to now change my, you know, change my focus to being more Jesus focused. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it ultimately, the fruit that came from it for me was realizing where the error was in my own life and um, taking that walk with God, not just expecting that I'll be healed in a moment and, and everything will be better and I'll be able to just do whatever I want from there. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that kind of like you said, the, um, isn't that what the people feel like? Like they want a quick fix and that's what deliverance is. They want something to come along and cast something out of them that they need to fight their way through. It could take could take weeks, could take months, could take years. I mean, we're talking about changing a person changing their mind. Right. And and a lot of times a way to, you know, what I would pose to that person is say like, okay, well, um, this will be a process because repentance is necessary because you need to be able to turn from that sin and acknowledge that what you did was wrong and build a new path. And building new habits takes time. Mm -hmm. But some people, they don't want, they, they want it now. And I know that's true because I've been that kind of person who I want to see results now. But nothing that's ever worth having or nothing that's ever worth it at the end was a, just a quick thing. You have to take the time, put your energy in, pour out your own soul in prayer. And that's when the change occurs because at that point, you've proven to God that you're legitimate. Yeah, well, yeah, but I, I'm so the people that were coming to you, do you think they were recent converts or, you know, were they, you know, like, I think you said you you got involved in this and around the around the pan, pandemic, right? So were these like That's correct. new converts who had found you and found this deliverance thing through the pandemic also and through Isaiah also? Would you would you say that's what they were? Now, it's not my place to necessarily judge somebody else's 
you know, walked with, walk with Christ. But I would say that um, a common theme was I've always been a Christian, but I've been astray or I've been off the path. Um, so I would say that a lot of the people who I was being contacted by um, were coming out of a very traumatic event. Or coming out of addiction or something like that, right? Correct. All right. Okay. Oh, wow. <clears throat> okay. So you told me something about an individual who you met um, through the, through the, uh, deliverance map who you ended up, <clears throat> were you attached to a group with Daniel Adams? that was in Indiana or something like that. How'd you get in Indiana? Um, I ended up in Indiana, um, a little bit later on. That was kind of like the final stage of the whole deliverance thing. But, um, Daniel Adams had paired up with Mike Signorelli. And at that time I had gone through, um, the, the breaker, course, which is a similar course to what Daniel Adams um, offered. Um, and it was informative and fun to watch. But once I um, got through that, uh, I decided I'd like to go to one of the conferences. So I ended up in um, Indiana at the conference with Daniel Adams and Mike Signorelli. This was roughly a year, year and a half ago. And um, yeah, just kind of noticed that um, I went to the conference with another gentleman who um, I had, we had agreed to go so that he could have some deliverance. So I agreed to pay for the hotel so that we could go and have the deliverance done by, you know, Daniel Adams himself or Mike himself or, or one of their main, you know, um, group of their pastors. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just noticed that when I got there, um, and especially on the way home, that's when everything fell apart um, with that particular deliverance. What do you mean fell apart? Well, um, when I got to the um, conference, there was a ton of people there and um, everybody was really excited and expecting to see Daniel and um, Mike. Um, but it seemed like there was some sort of, um, you know, edge in the air or something in the air where they were kind of competing with each other. And um, so Daniel ended up in the basement doing deliverance down there and Mike um, was upstairs and um, he was talking and, and doing mass deliverance upstairs. And at that time was... Um, asking for a donation for his Domino Revival movie. Oh, a donation for Domino Revival. Okay. He was saying that um, God had, you know, expressed to him that um, somebody was going to donate a very large amount of money that day, and they needed um, at least somewhere around $100,000 to make this movie happen. And if it didn't happen by the end of the weekend, then it wasn't going to happen. Wow. That's not pressure, is it? <laughs> well, um, I, I mean, I wasn't, I had already been, um, you know, tithing to the ministry monthly. So um, in my thought, I was like, well, I'm already giving. So the fact that I'm here and, you know, I'm giving as well, just being here. And so I wasn't necessarily interested in, in the donation part of it, but um, he made sure to, reiterate that several times throughout the um, conference. Was the conference free or did it cost to go even go to it? Uh, it was free to attend, but I did incur several, you know, um, monetary charges along the way, uh, you know, with getting the hotel and spending gas to get there and things like mm -hmm. that. The gentleman I was with actually volunteered to drive. So he paid for the, gas and the trip there and i paid for the hotel and uh you know amenities that way mm -hmm. okay well if you go to a free conference you and especially if you're paying a monthly fee to, the monthly fee was to be a breaker like to be yeah i had to pay a 50 dollar fee to take the course and be like a, cert, a certified breaker and in with um 
Daniel Adams, I chose kind of the basic package, just the, I think at the time it was like five ninety nine a month, and then that is what I paid probably for about two two years, um, while doing the training. So that made you a forerunner, or just a that made me a forerunner, and then um, in order to be certified, you have to go through the whole um, you know hub group and meet with the hub leader, and they have to sort of like decide you're ready to be a forerunner. So um, then wow. that takes however long it might take. And um, with our um, particular leader, um, he wanted to make sure that I knew the doctrine almost almost like word for word. So it was taking by, some time for me to be cleared. By the doctrine, you don't mean the Bible. Um, they had a uh, sort of like a set of be their beliefs that you had to like adhere to and kind of like, um, <clears throat> you know, affirm. And um, it, it had a lot to do with, um, you know, the Bible, the Trinity. And um, there was a specific section on like how to treat your leaders. Um, oh, they they wanted um, basically you. It, it almost seemed like they wanted to, you to submit to their authority um, because then when you were submitted to them, then you were then under God's authority too. By being under their authority, you were then under God's authority. Oh, they were your covering. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. So you you ran into, um, you ran into something at, with Isaiah Saldivar, you had the deliverance map, then there's a power struggle in the discord over here at Daniel Adams, they're, they're toxic. I call that toxic honor culture. Um, okay. All right. Ooh. And one thing you said, so, I, I want to clarify this. One thing you said, as soon as you can't ask a question, you know, for between you and me and for our viewers, if you can't ask a question and you're ostracized for asking a question, run, run, you can you can ask me anything you want to ask me. You can ask me why, I, because I'm not going to just say because I said so, or you know what I'm saying. That's that's not godly counsel, and that's not godly leadership either. You know, none of us are Jesus Junior or Holy Spirit. You know, the fourth person of the Trinity. Um, if you've got a leader, uh, they should be able to be asked questions. You were just asking, is this true? You know about as far as the you paying actors to go to the deliverance. And I know there was a specific, I've, I've got video of that myself. Uh, Catherine Crick and Daniel Adams had the same people showing up at their deliverances. Okay. And you probably, you might've saw that video in particular. I did. Then, that yeah. was actually exactly the video I saw. So, you know, you bring up, Hey, what, what gives, you know, and you're, they're done with you because you ask a question. N and, nothing, um, nothing should operate like that. You know, I was doing the deliverance too, but I wasn't feeling the need to film it. So um, it was something that kind of irked me was like, why why does all of the deliverances um, need to be filmed? And that that's something that, um, you know, is very personal, personal to the person you're filming too. So the person you're filming has to agree to be filmed. Mm -hmm. And yeah. would, you, would you really want your most intimate and, um, you know, personal information just aired to the rest of the world? No, no, I don't think it should be. You know. So my question is, why did why do they have to do so much filming of the deliverance? That's the appeal. This this doesn't appeal to even. It's not even. It doesn't even have a biblical appeal. It appeals to the senses. You know, people watch that stuff. It it appeals to. You know, it's visually appealing. Follow me. Yeah, I I think that's definitely part of it. And, um, you know, by no means do I know why these people do what they do. Um, but there's, there's just, there's other aspects of it that kind of hung me up as well. Like, um, say I needed somebody, um, like a covering to explain to me what to do in a deliverance situation. Well, um, now Isaiah and some of the other people, they no longer do personal deliverance. They only do mass deliverance. Mm -hmm. So, um, they're not doing personal deliverance anymore. 
but they have a whole group of unvetted people doing deliverance in their name, what's the reason they don't do personal deliverance anymore? Is it because, as they say, they're too busy to do one-on-one -on -one, and there's so many people uh, that need it that they want to sort of displace it to their, their followers? Okay, well, if that's the case, then you need to offer those people who are doing it for you better support. Mm -hmm. All you're right. no longer doing it. You're no longer doing it, you know, personally yourselves. What's the reason for that? Well, to me, it seems like a Ponzi scheme. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a scheme. All right, Daniel, it's a scheme. They're essentially not doing deliverance. Um, and Alexander Pagani himself has come out and said that half the people that are coming to their meetings aren't born again Christians. So, I mean, you're dealing with people who are unconverted and a lot of times drug issues, mental health issues. You know, there was a, a video, I encourage you to watch it if you haven't watched it. It was Sam Storms and John Clash debating deliverance itself, and they did it on the Bible Dingers channel. I'll send you a link to it. And Sam Storm said... That would be great. Huh? That would be great. Yeah, I, I will. And uh, Sam Storms was arguing in the affirmative of deliverance, and John Clash arguing in the negative and and sam storms even though he was arguing in the affirmative said that casting out a demon or doing the, you know say an exorcism would not be the first place he started it would actually be the last thing he went to you know first first order business paul says in um first corinthians 15 he talks about you know i delivered to you as a first importance you know and it was that christ was born uh, he was crucified, buried, and raised. It was the, the 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 delivery of first importance that Paul spoke of was the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So the first order of business in deliverance is to make sure somebody has, as it says in Colossians, been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son, and they do that through the gospel. You know, see, so, mm -hmm. so someone goes from an unregenerate child of wrath to a child of God, you know, born again. That's the first order of business. You know, beyond that, you know, we begin to feed them the pure milk of the word, you know, and that's another thing. I mean, if you're so hyper focused on demons, I believe you're demonizing people. You're not, you're not delivering them. You're demonizing them. They know more about Leviathan and Jezebel and squid spirits and nail biting spirits than they know about the Lord, you know, well, um, I'm currently in um, Chronicles, two Chronicles right now, and um, reading about the time where the Lord allowed a deceiving spirit to come in and, you know, to the prophets and basically deceive the, the believers. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm just, I'm meditating on that. I'm praying on that. And um, my goal isn't to tear anyone down. My goal is to just um, speak peace for myself be, to help me get through this and to um, make others aware of my experience. And um, I guess my question is, is anybody, has anybody else gone through this too? You know what, Daniel, I appreciate you. That's a great question. Um, I appreciate you coming forward and you express the fact that you were, you had felt embarrassed Okay. Yes, because I, I believe I was deceived. I believe I was deceived. And um, I, it's embarrassing to admit that you were wrong or that you followed a trail that led you further into the wilderness. Um, but I believe through um, testing and trial that I will wear the crown when I finish the race. Amen, brother. You know, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and a stranger they will not follow. And although you although you veered off course, you know, it sounds like you're back in a good place right now. And I just want to encourage you. And, and I, I am certain that there are others that have had the same experience you're talking about, but because of that embarrassment, they don't want to come forward, but to you and to them, if someone sees this and says, man, that's what happened to me, you know, um, you don't have anything to be a, the, the person. And I'm not, I don't want anybody to have a victim complex, you know, don't feel like you were a victim, but you were deceived. <laughs> that's what deception is. It's deceiving. It works specifically to deceive, right? So 
no one who gets deceived. That's like telling a a, a vic, victim of SA that it was their fault. You know, it wasn't your fault. But this is the this is where we can count on that text in Romans where it says all things work to, together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Because now you know the inner workings of this firsthand and you've seen it not work. You know, you've seen you've seen the way this, the, the people in the system don't know how to even deal with others and treat others. And you know what I'm saying? So well, now my armor is even stronger. You know, like, oh, yeah. it's one thing to feel rejected, but to feel rejected by, um, you know, the church itself, it, that can happen. It can happen. Mm -hmm. And, and um, if, if you are someone who feels like you were rejected, you're not alone and you can come out of it and be even stronger in Christ. When they, when they say put on the armor of Jesus Christ, your armor gets stronger with each blow you take. With each rejection you have to handle, you grow a new shell and you grow uh, even stronger armor for Christ. Mm. Amen. And, you know, it reminds me of, I say this all the time, in, in the world system, we know how the world operates and it's contrary to the kingdom. And in the world system, it operates by survival of the fittest or survival of the strongest, you know, conquer and overcome. But in the kingdom, it's supposed to operate what what sets us apart from the world is we are supposed to be those who help the weak survive. You know what I'm saying? And we're judged by how we treat the least of these, not by not by Isaiah Saldivar or Daniel Adams or Mike Signorelli's success, but the people that it seems like are getting crushed in the system. Were we there for them? Did we help restore them? Did we help meet their needs? You know, and that's that's just not going to take place. And it, it sounds like this, the, the whole organizing sort sounds like a mechanism. You follow me? There's like a, it does. there's like a mechanics. There's like a system to this, you know? Um, and the system ground you up. Brother. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm somebody who is still on their journey, trying to find the truth, um, trying to live for truth. And, you know, I faltered, I've fallen t from time to time, but, oh, um, I'm, I'm still searching and on the path I believe Jesus has set for me. Amen. As we all, and, will. And as we I think all that have. deliverance for me has become more like uh, peeling back the layers of an onion than necessarily a momentary fix where one minute I'm demonized and the next I'm free. Because for me, that would be the easy way out. Mm -hmm. based on what the Lord has spoken to my heart with his still small voice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're helping somebody that is less fortunate, um, you might be entertaining angels unaware. Amen. Amen. Well, it's like the, the infomercials and things like uh, lose 20 pounds in five days and things like this. Weird, weird claims that to, to you, you have a legitimate desire to lose weight. But they make claims that don't work. The way to lose weight is to control your diet, to increase your exercise level, to increase your activity level, to to change from eating all these high greasy foods. You know what I'm saying? Those, mm -hmm. and then you maintain that over time. You know, so it's, it's a it's, it's the same type of impulse buying that that the the consumerism quick fixes that that works in every other type of marketing. You know. Um, and like I said, it's the, it, it's the same type of mind change that that has to occur when you repent. You have to make a change with your mind and you have to acknowledge it and make the choice to make that change. And and so if things don't just happen overnight. A lot of times with the things you were describing, you, ha you there has to be action as well, such as, you know, trips to the gym or, you know, things like that. So. Um, Amen. 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 So, um, what else you got, brother? This has been excellent information. Um, unless you had any more questions for me, um, that was, I don't really have anything to add on or more to share. Um, I could offer a prayer. Hold on a second. All right, brother. Um, yeah, I'd like for you to say a prayer as we close out. We'll both say a prayer and I thank you. For okay. That. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. 
Um, dear Lord, I just want to pray for everybody who is here tonight and who might be watching. I just pray that you fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Um, we offer ourselves to you. Forgive us for our sins, Lord, and help us to put the armor of Christ on to protect us from um, any evil that might float our way. Lord, I just ask that you take the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and may they find an acceptance in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, let me say a prayer also. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would help the eyes of uh, others to open and you would uh, open the ears of others to hear this message tonight and to hear this young man's testimony. Anyone who's been a part of this system and been deceived and been misled, Lord, we pray that they would have the courage um, and the encouragement of your Holy Spirit to give them strength. Lord, we thank you that your word says you did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. And all those people who are actually going to deliverance, who have issues that are not demons, they have mental health issues, or they have addictions, or they have uh, trauma, PTSD, complex PTSD. Lord, we pray that, that the eyes of others will be open and these men would be found faithful to get resources and help for these people so that they could um, get better. And Lord, we we pray for for deliverance, for the true deliverance of the children of God to come upon these people. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The kingdom of God is a kingdom of deliverance. And when people put faith in Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Behold, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Thanks, Daniel, for sharing your story. And um, to everyone else, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, and share if you care. And if you have a story that you want to share of your experience, um, please be in contact uh, on the channel. Grace, peace, and love in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.